today we are very happy to have uh, Maya Goldenberg. Um, so Maya is an associate professor at the University of Guelph in Canada. She's been working on vaccine hesitancy for several years now. And uh, with the first publication, as far as I know, on this topic, I mean, uh, in 2016, uh, but maybe there was one earlier on that I didn't see. Okay, so it's been some time. Uh, before that, she had already been active in several fields uh, that are close to philosophy of medicine, including uh, in particular social epistemology and general questions about values and science around uh, medicine. Uh, she has worked, uh, among other things, on evidence-based medicine and other uh, such topics. So um, her recent book uh, is, of course, very timely. Uh, the title is Vaccine Hesitancy, Public Trust, Expertise and the War on Science. Um, we are very happy to have you uh, today, uh, Maya, and uh, we are we will partially blame it on vaccine exigency for you not to be able to be here in person, actually. So the, the, floor, is, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction, and thank you, everyone. It's true that I was hoping to be here, but I was um, stopped in so many ways, the first one being that I had the wrong vaccine to get to be to enter the EU. And then there were stumbles along the way. I think that speaks to similar to what uh, Tomas was describing to me. There's a lot of uh, bureaucratic problems around this global rollout of vaccines that are that that sort of play into the general narrative that this that the government isn't doing well and that the global community is not in sync and and I think I think we'll come back to those themes. But let let me let me uh, move in into the talk. Um, it is an honor to be here and thank you to the Phil Biomed Phil in Biomed people for for inviting me. Um, uh, so let me let me get started with uh, with uh, my work and my research, uh, which uh, was mentioned as this book came out. It was very well timed. It was. Um, came out in March 2021 on vaccine hesitancy. Of course, the research and most of the writing was done before COVID, um, when vaccine hesitancy was still a hot topic, especially around childhood vaccination. So a lot of my, my research is on childhood vaccination. The good news is that there is a lot of research already done on that. And with that, I can extrapolate into the current situation of COVID vaccine hesitancy, and I'll do that uh, you know, with, with pleasure. Uh, okay, so so I mentioned that my research predated COVID, and I really was interested. I started this work in earnest around 2015. I was interested in the controversy surrounding childhood vaccinations. Uh, the situation in industrialized nations presents a, a sort of interesting epistemic puzzle, um, uh, which is that against the strong scientific consensus on vaccines, and relatively good access to these vaccines, vaccine hesitancy persists. So this leads to a number of epistemic questions that I, that I wanted to address as, you know, as a philosopher of medicine. Uh, when I started this research, I wondered why people don't accept the weight of the scientific consensus. Um, as, and as I saw it, the crucial question that needed to be asked was, what evidence was going to convince these people? Now the answer to this question turned out to be more complicated than I thought. Uh, in fact, I was asking the wrong question. The question is not what evidence is going to convince people, but more about what is going on in the lives and circumstances of people that makes them unwilling to accept the evidence. Now that realizing that is when the, the work got really interesting. If, if vaccine hesitancy isn't an information problem, um, if it isn't a communication problem, then, then what is it? And um, so the research was completed. This is the cover of the book. It's uh, in English, but it, it may get translated into French. There's at least some uh, efforts to, uh, to do that. Um, this research uh, was completed uh, and most of the writing was done before uh, COVID was identified. But the themes that I address in the book specifically public trust in scientific institutions, that's gonna be my focus for today, and, and the problem of expertise, which is related to that. They are, I think, as relevant as, over, as ever during this time of COVID. So, um, so I think so are the arguments that I offer against dominant thinking about vaccine hesitancy. So these are the arguments that I, these are the, this is what I argue against in the book. I argued against the prevailing idea 
that vaccine hesitancy stems from the public's problematic understanding of science or relationship to science. Uh, I reject that. I also argued against the widely held view that vaccine hesitancy, at least in industrialized nations, is a problem of affluence. So the profile of the vaccine hesitator is usually a mother who is white and affluent. And I argue that there were good reasons to think otherwise and to do the empirical research to establish this fact. Now that second point I'm not going to talk about so much today, um, partly because I can't do everything, but partly because that second point is actually less relevant to the COVID situation. Um, during COVID, we, um, those of us that track this um, have noticed that the image of the COVID vaccine refuser is no longer the politically left affluent and urban mother. Uh, instead, politics, the politics of vaccine, who accepts it and who's likely to refuse it, have shifted, have shifted the image of the vaccine refuser to be someone who is still white, but is also rural um, and politically right wing. Um, the, the image that seems to persist, even in Canada, so I'm not sure about France, but even in Canada, the image of the vaccine refuser is an American Q, a non-believing Fox News watching Trump supporting Republican. That's the image that pervades. But I'll say that even that image doesn't capture the scope of, of COVID vaccine hesitators. Um, so as a whole, taking extracting a bit from these two arguments that I argue against, I understand vaccine hesitancy to be a bellwether or some kind of indicator of social fracture. And the COVID situation actually throws some of these signs and symptoms into much sharper belief. And we can talk about uh, that later. So my, my focus for today's talk is going to be on this first argument. The argument that I want to make is that vaccine hesitancy does not signal a problem of the public's scientific understanding. I don't think it's science denialism either or what's been called a war on science, at least in, in English media, they call it a war on science quite a bit. Um, so that's what I'll be arguing today, uh, making the case for that. And before I do that, I'm going to define vaccine hesitancy. Um, a vaccine hesitancy, the definition I use is that it is a feeling of ambivalence about vaccines or about vaccination. It is an attitude, it's not a behavior. The behavior of interest might be vaccine refusal, but we're talking about the, the attitude, the, the, the feelings about vaccines. Of course, the feelings about vaccines can predict behavior, but it doesn't guarantee it. We know that some people hesitate, but they still get vaccinated. Um, others hesitate and they refuse all vaccines. Um, among parents, some try to do modified schedules for their children where they'll do some vaccines, skip others, or space them out between a longer period instead of the usual first 18 months of life for most of them, or they, they might start their kids when they're older, that kind of thing. Now, public health scholars agree that the behavior is not the only thing that we need should be to, the only thing we should be interested in. Um, instead, we need to keep an eye on the attitude too, in order to protect public health. Um, this point of interest, looking at vaccine hesitancy, led to the formation of a WHO scientific advisory groups of of experts, they're called SAGE, that's the acronym, that focus exclusively on vaccine hesitancy in 2012. And this group was distinct from the other SAGE group that was already in place, the group on immunization issues more generally. Instead, it the idea was hesitancy deserved a group of its own because it is really that important as a public health um, indicator of vaccine success. So what I would like to do today in my work is, um, challenge the way we usually think about or frame vaccine hesitancy and refusal. Of course, frameworks are important. They structure how we view the problem and how we respond to it. So today we're going to look at the assumptions and values lying beneath the dominant framework, which I already mentioned, I call it the war on science, a very commonly used phrase in English language media and in popular science and, and politics books. Uh, I gave, I put on your screen here just a few examples of how war on science has, has played out. Um, the death of expertise is a similar commonly used phrase to imply that there's something amiss between science 
and the public, a war in fact, or between experts and non-experts, the, the, the masses, the publics. So I wanna assess those assumptions and their impact. And I'm going to suggest that it's an, in, an inadequate framework. It's a very persisting one. It's appealing in many ways, but it's not a good one in the end. And instead I'm gonna suggest a new framework, which I call a crisis of trust. And I developed that framework in, in my own uh, research in, in the book. So let's start uh, thinking about the war on science by thinking about the alleged war on science, by thinking about how should we understand public resistance to and public resistance and controversy over scientific claims. There are heated public controversies over vaccines, we all know. Uh, other hot topics are climate change, genetic, genetically modified foods, water fluoridation. So these are kind of publicly charged uh, scientifically, uh, scientific debates or debates around scientific technology. They are usually framed in combative terms. And the, co and the combatants, the sides of the com combat are uh, science versus nonsense, reason versus ignorance, expertise versus non-expertise. And we will often hear that science, rationality, and expertise are losing the war. The victims of this war are, are public health and well-being. And when, when commentators go further to say, who is responsible for this war? Who's responsible for this, for this uh, tragedy? Uh, it's usually said that it is members of the public, at least some of them. Um, those members of the public that turn away from science and rationality when they do things like refuse vaccination or deprioritize political action on climate change, they fail at the task of informed democratic participation. That is a dominant view. And you will see lots of examples of this. I certainly see it in scientific writing, in, in news articles, in political writing too, that we have serious friction, uh, frac um, serious divisions between the scientists and the knowledge elites and the rest of the public, okay? So um, in my own work, I looked at academic work, popular science writing, opinion pieces, and I saw some persistent themes that this is how I came to see this as a, as a war on science or call it that the kind of persistent themes that I saw again, again, and again, are that um, the, the, you've got all kinds of commentaries fretting over some kind of um, uh, so first science illiteracy. That's a common theme that, that look how scientific illiteracy threatens the American future. That's a common theme that I saw. Also the end of expertise and anti-intellectualism is a second pervasive theme. That's the idea that nobody listens to the experts anymore. And of course, we're we are all doomed for doing that. Um, and that's how most people characterize public resistance to scientific claims. Um, the resistance is seen as so destructive that it is characterized as, um, as a key problem of our time. The fact that the publics are resisting scientific consensus claims or in, if we don't have a consensus, at least the orthodox scientific view. We are now allegedly post-truth. Uh, we live in a post-fact world. Uh, we live amongst anti-science and that is deeply existentially threatening. And of course the culture war um, only gets amplified when you add a pandemic. COVID-19 was quickly described, this is from still from 2020, as our first post-truth pandemic um, with the accompanying, how, how do they describe this? They say with the accompanying infodemic, that's what the WHO characterized the rampant problem of false information. We've got this kind of twin pandemic happening, a viral pandemic and an info pandemic, and therefore uh, post-truth pervades. It's a pretty dire situation if you go on and read this kind of literature. People uh, feel very strongly about this. So what's being described here by very passionate defenders of science and truth is a culture war on science and expertise. It is taking place on our social media platforms. It is impacting all of us. And, and that is the dominant view. And that is the view that I want to challenge today regarding vaccine hesitancy and public resistance to scientific claims more generally. So back to this uh, image from before, I want to argue that we are not experiencing a war on science and expertise. 
I'm going to acknowledge that it is tempting to see it that way. For example, when members of the public repeat pseudoscience that they picked up on the internet, when they don't listen to their doctors about vaccines, but still, um, I'm going to say tempting to see that way, it that way, but not the best way to understand it. I'm instead going to make the case for this alternative framework to the war of science, namely the crisis of trust. And by that, I mean specifically public mistrust of scientific institutions, scientific experts, and their scientific claims. Okay. So um, this alternative framework, this crisis of trust, rests on a different conception about the relationship between science and society. Uh, the question, what is science, is conceived differently, and how do the publics relate to science? Um, and this differently posited relationship encourages different public health outreach strategies, different ways of dealing with the problem. It also redraws the lines of moral responsibility for this problem. Who's to blame for it? Um, I'm going to suggest that the problem no longer lies squarely in the epistemic failings of the public. So um, uh, let's start uh, the look at the uh, looking at the alleged war on science with what is assumed to be the nature of science. So I'm asking the question, what is science? This question, what is science? Well, of course we ask that a lot in, in philosophy, but it's rarely answered in abstraction. Instead, the answer to this abstract question, what is science, will reflect some sense of purpose. What is it that we think science is supposed to do? So there's a practical element. Um, th the question about the nature of science for our purposes um, is has something to do with the relationship of science to the public and the policy and sorry, to, to the public and to policymaking. What should science do and what does it do? So the more precise question, instead of what is science, is going to be what is the role of science in liberal de uh, decision making? Um, I'll answer that question with this image on your screen. So if you, let's say you're thinking about the war on science that I'm describing, whether you think the driver of vaccine hesitancy and refusal is the public's low scientific literacy or some kind of willful science denial, denialism and anti-expertise, both those, both those accounts share something in common, this grounding assumption about the role of science in democratic decision-making. In both those accounts, there's this thing called science that transcends partisan politics and the failure to recognize this rightful anchor in liberal democracies is extremely damaging. So I use this image, instead of giving you PowerPoint, uh, sorry, a point form, I, I use this image of a boat and an anchor to capture this assumed role of science in democratic society. Here we see science providing the anchor for the swells and surges of democratic choice. Science rationalizes uh, rule by the people, otherwise rule by the people is chaos. That's what's being assumed here. So public misunderstanding of science, the death of expertise are similarly threaten, threatening because they untether decision-making from its rational basis. So whether you're talking about a war on evidence or a war on experts, public resistance to scientific claims are similarly envisioned. It is a battle between established knowledge and everything else. Now, public health organizations often have good scientific backing for their directives. That I don't question. It's then assumed to follow from that good science that public health has exclusive claim to knowledge and to the most rational policies. It's also assumed from there that the problem lies with those who cannot appreciate the science and the science-backed policies. That's why we keep coming back to science as the problem. That's the thinking about vaccine hesitancy um, by in this war on science kind of framework. Now I'm going to agree to the scientific superiority of the vaccine consensus view, or at least in the time of COVID right now, the, the orthodox view in favor of vaccination is more compelling than the, than the uh, uh, minority view that there's something wrong with these vaccines. But I am going to challenge the other claims that the best policy follows from the best science and that the publics are the problem. 
I've, I've said this already, but I'll say it again. I'm working against an admittedly tempting way of thinking about controversies over well-established scientific claims. That disagreement over things like safety and efficacy of vaccines is a war over scientific evidence. This is a very common perception, common enough to make the cover of National Geographic magazine. And it is repeated by political and scientific leaders who feel the need to declare allegiance to science. Um, here's just an example. Here's the former leader of the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, where he tearily vowed to uphold science. He had an emotional talk to the entire CDC when he became uh, the head. Um, politicians like Hillary Clinton and Justin Trudeau now routinely express allegiance to science. They, they come out publicly and say, I believe in science. They join marches for science and so on. So that's where science stands in political and public discourse right now. So I get it. The view is of this problem as a war on science is tempting because the description seems to fit. We have, um, in the case of let's say a childhood vaccination, we have this huge body of literature supporting a scientific consensus. We've got opponents who pick out selective and often disreputable counter evidence and then there's the public caught in the middle that sometimes chooses wrongly. Uh, the reasons for public resistance to scientific claims like vaccines uh, is argued to be that the public misunderstands the science, they lack sufficient scientific literacy, that's the problem is. And popular science communicators strongly endorse this view. Uh, this image on your screen, this is Neil deGrasse Tyson, probably the most well-known English language science communicator, he's American. And he said this, um, this is in 2015, he said, scientific illiteracy is a tragedy of our time. Um, he's made similar claims since then. He hasn't changed his tune on that. And he said this and then referred to vaccine hesitators and other science transgressors as perfect examples of science illiteracy being the problem of our time. Uh, because of this kind of popular view, science communications tend to focus on knowledge transmission, especially debunking myths, because that's where they think the problem lies. If we could just debunk those myths, if we could just insert that proper knowledge into people's brains, then everything about vaccination would not be problematic. There is so much reason not to think that is true and so much so social science evidence in favor of that, that I barely know when to begin, but I'm where, where to begin with that, but I'll, I'll give it a try. What's wrong with that? Okay, and, uh, and, uh, but before I do that, I will say, of course, that parents do seem to be rejecting science when they explain their reasons for hesitating about childhood vaccines. Uh, there's so many surveys and interviews. I read so many in the years that I did uh, this uh, book, book research um, where parents will very commonly say things like vaccines aren't safe, vaccines aren't effective, vaccines aren't necessary. So they make these evidentiary claims in direct contradiction to the very consistent messaging being offered by their physicians, by public health agencies, and so on. So yes, the framework seems compelling for that reason. Um, but still, there are strong reasons to challenge that pervasive explanation that the public doesn't understand the science. Here's a few. Um, if misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the scientific evidence were the problem, Providing correct information and education would presumably correct this problem, and they don't. There have been, uh, there have been, yikes, excuse me. There have been um, years of well-funded education campaigns in France, in Canada, and elsewhere, and they have not changed the number of vaccine refusers significantly. Um, it, maybe they keep the numbers from going up, that is possible, but they are not really changing the dial and changing the landscape of vaccine refusal. Vaccine hesitancy numbers are even going up slowly, but they are going upward. Again, might be in response to those education campaigns, but it's not flipping the switch and getting everyone to see the truth about vaccines in the way that's expected in this kind of education model. Another reason to think poor in science literacy is not the root of the problem is that vaccine hesitators are often well-educated, at least around childhood vaccination, 
uh, social science research has found higher vaccine hesitancy among university degree holders, even postgraduate degree holders. So the more likely story about what's happening here is that people with higher education are putting their critical thinking skills to use. Some are reading the scientific papers and many more are allegedly reading between the lines to see what the establishment doesn't want them to see. So even if we allow for a few missteps in individual reasoning where people cherry pick the data or they misattribute correlation for causation, poor scientific literacy is not the key problem driving vaccine hesitancy. Now, some of these war on science type explanations of vaccine hesitancy go even stronger than the presumed knowledge deficit that I just described. Some argue that these they, they first they acknowledge that the education efforts are not working and they say the reason that they're not working is because vaccine hesitators and refusers cannot be reasoned with. They are irrational, it is a lost cause, and compulsion is the only way to get them vaccinated. Uh, the war on science has also been parsed as the death of expertise. Uh, in the middle of your screen, this is a 2018 book uh, published by, uh, written by the political scientist Tom Nichols. It made it to the New York Times bestsellers list because it was so apparently, it was so apparently convincing um, that no one listens to experts anymore. That was his argument. No one listens to experts any, anymore and people found that very convincing. In the book, he, he laments this this real-time realization of the Dunning-Kruger effect. The public think they know better than experts, and because of that, science denialism and irrationalism uh, can then thrive. Finally, leaving sort of popular science and magazines and journal and, uh, and newspaper articles, we want to look at the academic research too. And I looked, of course, at science and technology studies that STS and maybe science studies more, uh, more broadly um, is a good place to look because it researches these very questions about the nature of science, its relationship to society and the status of expertise. I will say that it was surprising to me to find that some science studies scholars take up some form of this narrative of science denialism and the public embrace of irrationalism, which is consistent with the war on science framework. Uh, I'm thinking of some of the prominent thinkers in, social, in science studies and, and science and technology studies, uh, Latour, uh, Kitcher, uh, Collins, um, all of them in their recent writings have wondered if the discipline's 50 or so years of critical science studies that show the social constructedness of, of science might have contributed to the current frustrating situation where scientific experts are not seen as more reliable than non-experts and everybody's kind of got a point. Even Latour, that surprised me the most, has come around and said, whoa, uh, maybe this idea about science being social constructed has been taken too far. Um, he, of course, he doesn't want to take blame for it, though he recognizes that his name is often associated with the sort of relativist view of, of science. Now, of course, none of these thinkers end up fully blaming STS for critical science studies, uh, but they do agree that science and experts no longer have the respect they deserve. So I'm going to give you an example. I can't talk about all of them, but I'll talk about uh, the works by the sociologists Harry Collins and Robert Evans. They are sociologists of expertise, and they wrote this book, Rethinking Expertise, to address this very problem of the downgrading of experts, came out in 2008. So in this book, they initiated this new area of science studies, working to reclaim the status of experts and expertise, which they thought had, is, is too low and, and the death of expertise is therefore uh, the result. So Collins then uh, wrote a popular science book, which he called, Are We All Scientific Experts Now? That kind of rehashes the 2008 book. And in that, uh, in Are We All Scientific Experts Now? He coined the phrase default expertise to explain what he thinks is going on. He says default expertise is the problematic idea that everyone is an expert 
or no one is an expert is an expert. Instead, we have this leveling of epistemic expertise, where uh, you know a research a climate science researcher somehow has equal footing as someone who read stuff on the internet. That's what that's what uh, um, Collins describes with default expertise. Uh, furthermore, default expertise, this idea that everyone or no one is an expert, we're all kind of the same. It uh, is meant to describe this sense of empowerment, the sense that every citizen is part of the game of science and technology. Uh, he goes on to say, it's that feeling of the right to judge that ordinary citizens think they possess because science and technology are so fallible. So that's that critical science studies uh, framework coming in. And now people think they know as much science as everyone else. That's what's being proposed here. So default expertise is supposed to explain the apparent reasonableness of telling worried parents to do your research and decide for yourself. It also is meant to explain the energy with which some vaccine hesitators take up the challenge. So Collins, of course, wants to save sociology of science as much as he wants to save expertise. Um, he uses his sociological methods to provide a response to those armchair researchers or those default experts who are investigating pediatric vaccines and think they know something that their doctor doesn't. So what, what Collins does is he draws from the periodic table of expertises, that's not a typo, they called it expertises, I don't know why, that he earlier developed with, with uh, Evans in the 2008 book. And I'm not gonna go through this entire taxonomy here, but this table details the many kinds of expertise that are available to us. So they talk about grades of expertise and kinds of expertise. He compares two key kinds of expertise, primary source knowledge and interactional expertise. Those are the two boxes that I put circles around on, on your screen. So primary source knowledge gives you the kind of expertise of a non-specialist that you gain through reading scientific papers. So from reading the primary sources, let's say you're a parent, you are willing to pay, uh, go past the paywall and read scientific papers, you can, if you do it well, gain this level of primary source knowledge. You've read the papers. Now, interactional expertise is specialist expertise, and it is different. It is the knowledge and understanding that comes from being part of the specialist community. So a parent who is, um, who is well read because they access scientific papers can have primary source knowledge um, on vaccines. That's their level of expertise. But that is different from having interactional expertise, which is only had by those who are members of the relevant expert community. So only this expertise will give you the kind of specialist knowledge that you need to be an expert on the subject. Uh, the, the authors call it specialist tacit knowledge. This is what makes you an expert. So Collins is telling us here that you can read online content, you can even read scientific papers from the perspective of an outsider. By doing this, you will absorb a lot of information, but you'll still never have interactional expertise, which is the sort of expertise developed by being part of a community of scientists, a community of scientists knowing what they think, getting a feeling for what they do and how they think about things. Collins explains that if you get your information only from the journals, you can't tell whether a paper is being taken seriously by the scientific community or not. Um, in short, you cannot get a good picture of what is going on in science from the literature alone. Now, so with that, Collins is able to answer his question, are we all scientific experts now? And his answer, of course, is no. And interactional expertise is that key concept explaining this. Even if everyone is an expert at some things, that doesn't give specialist knowledge on that doesn't give specialist knowledge to everyone on everything. So vaccine skeptics will often insist that they are experts on their own children. That is a common thing that vaccine uh, hesitant parents will say. But says Collins, that doesn't make them experts on vaccines. Specialist knowledge arises from education and work and immersion in the community of experts. So you're best to leave judgments of vaccine safety and efficacy to the scientists, not to the parents. So that's the summary of the work uh, there by Collins and, and Evans. And this is how leading sociologists of expertise want to reclaim expertise. 
they say, sure, scientists could be better at communicating with the public. Scientists could be better at policing transgressions within their communities. Um, uh, but at the heart of the problem lies in the public's confusion about the nature of expertise. The public think they have interactional expertise when indeed they do not. So once the public understand that we are not all scientific experts, expertise will be restored and public controversy over scientific claims can end. So the knowledge deficit is thereby filled, not by giving people the science they need, but by giving them the proper understanding of expertise, and then we'll all be fine. So in this argument for the special nature of interactional expertise is the acknowledgement that knowledge arises in communities. He's a sociologist after all. So Collins keeps talking about having a feel, being a part of a community, like the community of, of specialist scientists, of course. Now this idea that knowledge is social, that, that science is social knowledge is a key claim in, so, in social epistemology in an area that I work in. Now, I think Collins' acknowledgement of the social nature of scientific knowledge is right, but it doesn't go far enough. A key feature of this social exercise or communal exercise of knowledge building is trust. The reason trust is important here is because all of our relationships are built on trust. So I'm going to show by bringing in considerations of trust, we need to attend to the ways that trust figures into the social exercise of knowledge building. And that's going to get us a better view of why vaccine hesitancy happens. So of course, saying that, that gets me to my preferred framework, which is the crisis of trust. So I want to take this picture of science as a community of knowers, something that, that Collins and sociologists of expertise will confidently subscribe to, I wanna take it in different directions. I'm going to characterize public resistance to science and the so-called death of expertise differently. I'm going to argue it is not a reflection of scientific misunderstanding or a war on anything, but rather it is mistrust of scientific institutions. That is the crisis of trust. To make my case, that the problem is poor trust and not some kind of poor regard of science, I, I'll of course need to say something about the ways in which science and trust are linked. So here's the general and I'll get into the details. Uh, I'll argue that trust is endemic to science. Trust plays a part in knowledge creation in the making of scientific claims. Uh, trust plays a role in managing dissent and disagreement. Uh, also in consensus building, and of course, the legitimation of the consensus. So it is poor trust relations that undermine scientific practice and policy, uh, because science cannot fulfill many of its social and epistemic aims when trust is low. Vaccine hesitancy, to, to bring this in, is a symptom of a trust deficit or poor public trust, specifically poor public trust in medical and scientific institutions and their governing structures. Because these institutions need public trust to achieve their ver various aims or mandates, public resistance to scientific claims is not squarely a problem of the public's, but a problem with scientific governance. And saying that invites new ways of addressing vaccine hesitancy. Okay. Before linking trust and science, let's just be clear about what I mean when I talk about trust. Trust is a very heavily theorized concept in, in ethics, in philosophy of science, uh, and in social theory. Uh, particularly good attention is provided by feminist theorists in all of these domains. And I think that's because feminist research focuses on relational aspects of, of morality, knowledge, production, and social structures, especially relationships involving imbalances of power between participants. And those are useful considerations when you're trying to think about trust. Now, the concept of trust is taken to mean having confidence in someone or something. So all these fields actually seem to agree, on, at least on this definition. So discussions about trust in the context of science usually refers to epistemic trust. Uh, to, vest, to invest epistemic trust in someone is to trust them in their capacity as providers of information. That's almost a direct quote from, from Vilholt uh, in this well-known paper on epistemic trust or, or trust in science. Uh, 
Uh, when we trust a person, we can also trust an organization or an institution. We are judging them to be dependable and also worthy of our confidence. So trusting others is risky, but it is also unavoidable. That's because when we find ourselves in situations where we, where we lack adequate information to know for ourselves, and this happens often, every day I'd say, we need to trust others. But there is risk in trusting others. We know that this trust may be broken. So because of that, trust requires um, what's been described in some sociology literature as a leap of faith. Uh, that's uh, the leap of faith language is, is influenced by the work of George Simmel. Um, so this leap of faith in order to trust, this leap refers to some necessary bridging of an information gap in situations of risk. Um, epistemically dependent people will fulfill any knowledge gap with a kind of suspension or a bracketing off of uncertainties. So sometimes we need to let the uncertainties go and just trust the expert. That's, that's what happens when we trust someone uh, on information that we cannot vet for ourselves. And of course, we can't vet for ourselves. That's why we're, we need expert advice. Now, the confidence with which a trustee leaps is captured in the expectation that the expert has goodwill or at least moral integrity, that they are trustworthy. There's this additional uh, expectation that the expert will be properly motivated to act, to act uh, in ways that are beneficial to the epistemically dependent person. So our confidence in any expert is going to hinge on their moral character, not just on their epistemic credentials. Uh, there's been qualitative research uh, into parental decision-making regarding vaccines that highlighted multiple leaps of faith taken by parents in the, in the face of incomplete knowledge and anxiety over future unknowns. Will this vaccine hurt my children? That kind of thing. So parents tend to get advice from, on vaccines from people they know. They'll be peers, family members, healthcare providers, and those trusting leaps will either be taken or they'll be denied. And trust, because of that, trust is a means of social cohesion. Who you trust is creating a relationship with them. Um, it's also a connection that um, creates affective or emotional commitments. Um, what's important for our discussion, so this, this is mo mostly coming from social theory and ethics literature, but let me bring it back to the scientific issue at hand here. What's important for our discussion here is it is not the growing volume of data that are convincing parents to vaccinate their children, rather a willing leap in favor of the scientific consensus. That's why people vaccinate their children. Vaccine hesitators and refusers situate themselves in different spheres of familiarity that disqualify the majority view on vaccines. And that, that point explains why we often find clusters of vaccine refusers. They often live in similar communities. They share lifestyles, they share ideologies, and they often share attitudes about vaccines. What's also important about what I just said is that it suggests symmetry between these two groups, the vaccine refusing parents and the vaccine accepting parents. It is not that the vaccine accepting parents are informed about the science while the other is uninformed. Uh, the calculations that they're making, these moves are uh, towards being part of a group or belonging to a group do not are not well explained by cognitivist perspectives on risk assessment, and they do not track with levels of education and scientific literacy. Instead, Annette Beyer seems correct to describe suggest uh, uh, describe trust as cognitive. So there's still part of that affective, but also uh, cognitive, which means being done with purpose. So it's got what we're saying is your sphere of influence will have a big impact on uh, your vaccine uh, attitudes, not because you don't think for yourself, but because you want to fit in with the group that you identify with. And there's, there's a good social uh, psychology work on explaining these kind of group dynamics around vaccine and other scientific attitudes. Okay, let's move to trust within scientific communities. I think this will be more familiar to this, to this group. Um, science, of course, is thought to be rigorous by being wary of trust or, or ambivalent about trust. Don't listen to the authority, examine the evidence for yourself. That's the popular or orthodox understanding 
of science. And that view made the alternative thesis that came out of science studies around the 1980s very radical. This alternative thesis was that trust relations make scientific progress possible. So you, it's moving against the enlightenment ideals of epistemic individualism, where you study for yourself or radical skepticism. Instead, a compelling case was made for epistemic dependency and trust in science. How does that work? Scientists trust in the peer reviewed knowledge that supports their work. They don't check it all for themselves. Uh, they trust their collaborators to do their piece of the project properly. No one has the time or expertise to do all the work for themselves and to check every claim. Uh, this is not to say that hard data and logical arguments are not necessary, but since not every scientist can do the radically skeptical effort of testing each claim, much of what we consider to be scientific knowledge is built on relations of trust. This comes from the work of John Hardwick that might be uh, familiar to, to some people here and uh, Shapin and Schaefer in their well-known book, uh, Leviathan and the Air Pump, they developed this idea too. So against this image of the scientist as a lone genius, Science Today is very collaborative. It's exercises of partnership and there are relationships of trust operating between uh, these actors and the institutions. They mostly operate invisibly in the scientific exchange, but they keep science going. So behind the scenes, trust operates in establishing and legitimating knowledge as true and universal. By that, I mean true for everyone. Now let's leave science communities and think about public trust, uh, the relationship between scientists and the public. So we're, we've moved to the public stage here, and this is where vaccine controversy takes place. At least around pediatric vaccines, there's very little controversy within the scientific community. Um, uh, instead, um, uh, instead um, uh, most of the controversy around vaccines are uh, on the public stage. So on the public stage, epistemic dependency and trust in experts is far more obvious to see. We see members of the public, including I include myself among them, relying on scientific knowledge to inform our everyday choices and practices. Everything from whether to take an umbrella with me when I leave the house to whether I should get the COVID vaccine. We do not have the time and skill to check each claim for ourselves. Instead, we look to experts for advice. So when the channels of knowledge translation work well, the move from expert advice to non-expert acceptance of that advice and action can go smoothly. But we're talking about vaccine hesitancy today because the relationships between experts and non-experts are not so secure. Members of the public are arguably well advised to defer to scientists with relevant expertise. Collins says that, so does Hardwig and everyone else. Uh, those scientists have interactional expertise, which make it more likely that their judgments will be right than our own personal positions. So I think we all agree that the public benefits from well-placed trust in experts. The challenge is knowing when that trust is well-placed. The risks of harm remain, and the public may choose wrongly because they're worried about being harmed. Of course, we can try to reduce that risk of choosing wrongly by assessing expert advice. We can't assess the content of scientific claims if we are not in a position to judge, but people will evaluate the character of the scientific expert or the integrity of the institutions they represent. Uh, the philosopher Elizabeth Anderson calls this second order uh, determinations of scientific claims. So public members of the public will follow expert advice if we trust those experts to be both epistemically and morally responsible. Uh, so a number of philosophers, Hardwig, uh, Kevin Elliott, uh, and some others have detailed the epistemic and moral qualities that we look for in a trustworthy expert and have outlined an ethics of expertise, but, but we're not going to get into what it takes other than to say there are some moral and epistemic commitments that we wanna see, sorry, behaviors or, or attitudes among experts that will make us trust them. Then we'll trust what they have to say. So the rationality, uh, this is all to say that the rationality of following expert advice hinges on both trust and credibility. Experts must be trustworthy 
and non-experts must recognize them as such. Um, the terminology of credibility is used, credibility is meant to mean being recognized as trustworthy. Whether you are or not, the public needs to see you as trustworthy. And so relations of trust mediate these successful um, exchanges between scientific institutions and the public. So this is all to say that trust is really important if you want the public to listen to your expert advice. Relations of trust, of course, don't preclude disagreement and controversy. In science, uh, in scientific communities, disagreement and dissent are even uh, are expected and even encouraged. But it is trust that helps manage those disagreement and make them helpful rather than rather than completely harmful. Um, I'll, I'll explain. Uh, the ways of managing dissent and disagreement in science is uh, is is looked at quite a lot in philosophy of science, and what's what what has been accepted is a sort of democratic orientation towards truth seeking and consensus building. So science should be public and accountable. Um, that's the democratic norm that is held up as an ideal, not just in politics, but also in science. So social epistemologists, I'm thinking of Kitcher and, uh, and Longino, they view these mechanisms very favorably, and they even make recommend, recommendations to improve the democratic tenor of science. For example, they say science would be better if we increase diversity in scientific communities to make dissent and criticism more robust. Longineau is best known for this argument. Uh, we also want to limit spurious dissent, thing like uh, dissent that's been created by industry that's meant to be obstructionist rather than knowledge seeking. That's an important move too. Um, DeMello and DeMello Martin and Intamin in their recent book argue that they think these efforts to regulate dissent will ultimately fail. Um, but that doesn't stop people from trying. People want to make science more critical. They want to get rid of the noise and get us to legitimate truth-seeking dissent and disagreement. Now, it's with all of these communicative practices in place that a robust scientific consensus can arise on some issue, while points of disagreement can still respectfully endure without rupturing community cohesion. Now, compare that to public controversies. Science controversies on the public stage are not so well managed. We don't have comparable shared rules for the management of disagreement and for consensus building. There are no shared frame, frames of reference. Instead, we've got facts, uh, alternative facts. I don't know if you use that term in, in French too, facts and alternative facts. Which one is legitimate science? Which one is junk science? Conflicts of interest often exist on both sides. Um, as if that isn't enough to work through, the science controversies that play out on the public stage usually aren't about science at all, but rather what follows practically from accepting that science as true, that scientific claim is true. What policies will be put in place? How will those policies impact my livelihood and sense of well being? Um, uh, Dan Sarowitz has argued this point, if you're interested, and Daniel Hicks has described science controversies as proxy politics for that reason. So you might hear public argument about, uh, about very technical issues like reproduction numbers and COVID or, or, or technicalities about climate modeling, but it's usually that's not, we argue about the science, but the real worry is about what follows if someone accepts that scientific claim is true. Now, this can be a hard realization for some, that science can't guide us to good policy or right action, that science doesn't neutralize political partisanship and rationalize democratic decision making. It is shocking to many vaccine advocates that the scientific consensus on childhood vaccines has not settled public concern. Instead, the consensus gets positioned as one side of a debate where scientific experts need to insist on their legitimacy against very disreputable opponents who claim to have the science and the moral credibility on their side. And I think we should appreciate this surprise because the consensus is supposed to settle debate, not invite it. It does this by representing the majority view of those who are most suited to pronounce on the issue. Now, consensus claims also serve a public function. They're supposed to educate the public on issues and promote appropriate response, whether that's personal or politically. The failure to achieve these aims is no doubt 
frustrating. People will rightly ask, doesn't the consensus deserve more deference? Because the consensus is our best approximation of scientific truth, it's produced by the best of sciences, procedures and practices, the universal applicability of these findings, of course, rest in the methods of consensus building. So when the public suggests that the consensus is biased or impartial, they are rejecting an elaborate set of methodological, epistemic, and institutional mechanisms that are meant to ensure reliable knowledge and public benefit from that knowledge. Science is not supposed to be something you believe in or are against. Um, and I'll agree that science is not a matter of belief, but I'll object that you do need to trust it. That's what's, that's what's missing here. Okay, so what's important here is that much of what members of the public know about vaccines pivots on epistemic trust, epistemic trust in experts. Uh, the same thing has been argued about public belief on climate change. Ben El Massey, the philosopher Ben El Massey argued this point. So tied to any consensus statement or position paper in biomedicine are claims to the epistemic and moral legitimacy of its authors and their institutions. Vaccine hesitators and, and more strident vaccine refusers reject those claims of legitimacy. So what is the appropriate response when the consensus doesn't fulfill its function of uh, fulfill its function of, um, of engendering public trust. Here's what happens now. Vaccine hesitators and refusers are ridiculed for raising concern, for questioning expert testimony, and for taking minority dissenting opinion. Uh, I just wanna show you this slide. This is an old art article, but I always come back to this slide because going, we're here we are going against the democratic tenor of science when a science journalist writes articles like this one, this is why you have no business challenging scientific experts. Of course, he does this, this uh, author, an American, Chris Mooney, he does this to convey sincere disgust over the current state of affairs. Why, he asks, would vaccine supporters take the word of a media savvy celebrity mom, he's talking about Jenny McCarthy, who attributes her knowledge to the University of Google over many scientific experts? That's a good question, I'd say, but to say you have no business challenging scientific experts does not capture what we should be doing here in response. Of course, we know that the consensus is an expert-generated directive for epistemically dependent outsiders. It's meant to offer the scientific information that we need to know, but the mechanisms that are used to ensure the trustworthiness of that information, this negotiation of conflicting views in a, at conferences and in journals, the replication of findings, when that actually happens, not that often, peer review and so on, all those mechanisms are internal to the scientific community and largely shielded from public view. And so in that final step of the expert lay exchange, where if all, where if all goes well, the public accept the scientific consensus view, it does require some degree of a trusting leap of faith that the scientific experts have done their due diligence and reported responsibly. So that trust requirement, of course, places the outsider in a vulnerable position. And there's no sympathy for that. The publics are implored to trust science, to trust in a process whose trustworthiness lies in it being shielded from public opinion and from non-expert contributions. So the publics find themselves in this position where you don't have an eye on or participation in the innermost practices of scientific knowledge and consensus building. There's also various threats of sanction for not accepting the findings, but you are instructed to trust. And some people are just not willing to do that. Of course, we want to blame social media for this problem. That's, uh, I don't think I've ever given a talk on vaccines or someone didn't say, what about social media? Now I have a slide to respond to that. Yes, misinformation proliferates and is amplified in these virtual echo chambers. Uh, this is a headline uh, here from a German study showing that just five minutes on the internet increased parents' doubts about childhood vaccines. So yes, online information has a big impact. But these dubious claims 
these things that we that uh, these dubious claims that we read online, they only gain traction because they fit into a broader narrative that healthcare is somehow problematic. Um, informed news consumers, of course, know about these problems in health research and practice as much as they know about the problems with internet information. So these are usually well-informed parents who know about the replication crisis, the weakness of the peer review system, um, questionable disease categories being created to sell more pharmaceuticals. Uh, the term for that is disease mongering. They know about class action lawsuits against pharmaceutical companies. These are all part of health consumers background knowledge. So parents draw on these narratives when they evaluate new information about vaccine risks. So that prior trust will have some determination of whether they accept the consensus view. And yes, they know that online information can be bad. So in, instead of asking, um, instead of thinking that misinformation is the problem, we need to be asking why parents are looking past orthodox sources like uh, I don't know, American Medical Association or, or European councils and going to the internet at all? What is it that's not being fulfilled by those conventional channels of information? De Decision-making on vaccines is difficult. People get, up, get caught up in this noisy confusion of a competing claims and alternative voices Experts are allegedly disagree with each other. There's social media amplifications. And parents describe that they are generally unsure about how to support their children's health. And there are many unvaccinated people unvaccinated against COVID that say the same thing, not about their children or maybe about their children, but also themselves. They don't know who to believe. Of course, those dissenting and questioning and confusing voices make the decision process more difficult, but it is due to poor trust that the institutions tasked with protecting the public good are not able to carry out their mandate by guiding parents out of this difficulty and offering a definitive voice of reason. Their consensus statements, as well written as they might be, are not fulfilling that public function. Um, there are implications of this for scientific uh, institutions that need to be thought about. Everyone seems to agree that the publics need science, but my point is that it goes both ways. Science needs the public too. Um, fulfilling many institutional mandates hinge on positive public relations. Of course, science strives to create universally applicable knowledge, but, and this knowledge is only universal insofar as it is accepted by all the stakeholders. This places a demand on scientific communities to earn and maintain the trust of the publics. Um, research institutes, research agencies rely on stable relationships with the outside, at minimum to be able to access tax dollars and to be left alone to do their work. That's a minimal level of trust that is needed by scientific institutions that do more esoteric science, science that is less publicly relevant. But of course, I'm talking about policy relevant science, research that is motivated by practical goals like furthering human health, animal welfare, environmental welfare. There are more elaborate ties to the public. And these, that means that these practical goals require scientific claims to be accepted by stakeholders outside of its specialized scientific communities. So they need the public to buy in in order to do the work that they want to do. Public health, of course, is a good example of that. You can only improve population health if the public largely accept or follow and follow your recommendations. Um, health recommendations and consensus statements are banking on the public's trust in the institution's efforts to honestly inform and to protect. So earning and maintaining public trust is crucial for public health. It is not enough to have the best science. The science needs to be trustworthy, but it also needs to be trusted by public health stakeholders. Uh, vaccine hesitancy persisting as it does suggests that institutions have failed to build and maintain that public trust. And that warrants some self-reflection about these institutions and agencies own trust building practices. Okay, I'll draw it all uh, together now, just a few more comments. So this is a, this is a summary really. Um, I've argued here that evidence, the evidence that most of the publics accept on vaccines turns crucially on epistemic trust. 
And it's poor trust in the expert sources that engender or create vaccine he hesitancy. In other words, consensus claims won't convince people if the source is not perceived as trustworthy. So what if we focused on building that trust rather than educating the misinformed public or puzzling over the moral and epistemic failings of the public? Doing this does not discount that public agencies will have the science on their side, that they will have the best access to scientific information and make the most um, reliable scientific claims. It does mean that we have to recognize that the best science is not enough. This is not a war with the publics or a war over science. I've offered a different picture of science in relation to the public than the firm anchor mooring uh, liberal decision-making. Now, science should still be understood to hold firm ground here when we're deciding, let's say, what to do about a viral pandemic. But the idea that evidence somehow speaks or dictates right policy is a fiction. All evidence is subject to interpretation, and political and policy decision-making requires many non-scientific considerations. So the language of evidence-based, or as many political leaders said during COVID, we will follow the science, it is misleading in that respect. Following the science does not give us the policies that we need. Uh, scientific evidence instead operates within a constellation of social influences that guide policies as well as personal decision-making. So it's good trust relations between science and the public that will actually ensures that science will stand prominently within policy frameworks rather than get ignored. Uh, and good relations with the public need to be maintained for that reason. The current tendency to criticize the skeptical public for failing to appreciate the importance of scientific reasoning or the authority of, expert, of experts, it does not address the problem of mistrust of scientific institutions. If anything, it might exacerbate that mistrust by entrenching a very polarizing us versus them mentality. Okay, I will finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maya. And uh, congratulations for this talk with many ideas and many things to discuss. So we have 15 minutes for discussion. Uh, who wants to start? Please raise your hand. Okay. Uh, so first question, uh, uh, Jose. Uh, okay, um, I'm gonna start. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for your talk. Uh, I think you made a very compelling case uh, uh, against the war on uh, anti-science. Found that interesting. I have um, a, a question about the, your framework of trust. Uh, and when I think about vaccine exigency, uh, in my head, I try to compare that a lot to antibiotics because I don't see like a movement against antibiotics. Uh, and, and actually, with COVID, we even saw the people that are trying to discredit vaccines are pro, are in favor of uh, drugs that have been unproven, like uh, hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin. Uh, and so my question is, is there something uh, specific about vaccines that, and trust that, that, is, that doesn't apply to, to medications like antibiotics? Or should we expect that the problem of trust to be not only for vaccines, but anything that uh, the medical establishment and the pharmaceutical companies and the, and the scientists uh, try to put forward? Um, that is such a good question, and it's among the many things that are interesting about vaccines is that, yes, there is something different about vaccines that it gets politicized and picked up in ways that other medications don't. Um, so, yes, I get that is a good question for vaccine researchers. What's unique about vaccines? And uh, I, I'll start by saying there is an interesting historical arc if you read sort of histories of vaccination. Um, where um, vaccines have always, since their first, uh, first uh, they were first made, this is back, going back to the days of Edward Jenner, they have always been this phenomena, phenomena where the current, the whatever the um, whatever the cultural anxieties and fears of the time get projected onto vaccines in a way that other healthcare interventions don't. And I'll, I'll suggest why. So some examples are like 
uh, are like, okay, so um, fears around childhood vaccines became a concern about autism. Autism was sort of rising in, in recognition at the time that the MMR vaccine were, was bundled together. So people took their concerns about children and autism still very Mis very poorly understood. And they said, oh, it must be the vaccines. Uh, back in the days of Jenner, um, people were worried that mixing um, a, mixing uh, animal products, because it was made from cowpox, so cowpox vaccine had animal product in it, mixing that with human bodies was sinful and that people, uh, people would be damned for taking the vaccine. And there's been movements along the ways in different countries and different contexts where whatever people are worried about at that moment politically, they project that onto the vaccine. So vaccines have been, uh, uh, have been argued to be uh, you know, weapons of the state for genocide. They've been all kinds of things. So why vaccines and not antibiotics? Well, um, one could be that at least the early vaccines, there was danger associated with it. And it was a dangerous inter intervention for a protective mechanism. So people might be more likely to take risks when they are already sick, while this protecting a healthy person, especially a healthy child, which of course is going to elicit some kind of emotional response, um, created this kind of aversion where people said something doesn't feel right here. You know, in ethics, they talk about the sort of yuck factor where people just resist it kind of viscerally, and then they start looking for post hoc justifications. So that's when, uh, you know, mistrust of government, cultural genocide, uh, autism concerns, um, toxicity due to, um, due to the chemicals and vaccines start to be brought into. Uh, into these vaccines. So yes, there's a long history of vaccines being uniquely um, scary and, and anxiety provoking in a way that medications don't. Thank you. Uh, other questions? So I have one in the meanwhile, a short one, but okay, Hadi first. Uh, thank you. Hi, hi, Maya. It's been a long time since we saw each other at the JCB yes. back probably 15 years ago. And thank wonderful talk. Fully agree that this is a critically important question. Uh, as you may recall, I'm also an epidemiologist, so I like to understand empirically how much of each of the variables associated with different issues are actually important. And I'm wondering if there's any empirical evidence of of the, say, percentage of hesitancy that's trust-related versus science understanding-related versus following the leaders-related versus some of the other issues that you mentioned earlier, you know, how, how do they stand in relationship? So is, is trust 30% of the problem or is it 80% of the problem? Um, it, it depends on which demographic and, of course, which poll. There is a lot of surveys being done during the time of COVID. As you know, uh, you know, governments kind of turned on the tap and did so much funding of COVID-related research. So there was a slew of uh, polls of healthcare workers, general publics, much more cross-sectional than than the research that used to be done surveying vaccine hesitant parents. It was almost entirely done on, on, uh, on white people and not people of color, but that, that, that is not the point here. But when they ask questions, do you trust the government? Will you take the vaccine? What are your concerns? There are definite collections, uh, connections that we see. Um, people's willingness to uh, take the vaccine corresponds to do they trust the government structures for during COVID is if you trust the government to uh, handle the pandemic well, you are more likely to get vaccinated. If you think they are completely uh, doing a terrible job, you are less likely to get vaccinated. So, so your your trust in government is is a is strongly correlated. Um, as I mentioned, your level of of uh, scientific literacy or or usually they use the proxy university education is not a good indicator. Of, of vaccine hesitancy, or I, sh I should say it wasn't around childhood vaccines. Um, instead, vaccine hesitancy seems to follow certain political norms. So where once vaccines were um, mistrusted by people who were left-leaning and affluent and urban, I called them the characteristic vaccine hesitator, now people who are left-leaning are more likely to accept the COVID vaccine. I think this has a lot to do with um, U.S. politics, politics um, trumping 
Trumpisms and everything related to that, where um, refusal of the COVID vaccine became associated with um, right wing uh, pro Trump uh, mistrust of government ideologies, while vaccination science became associated with Biden and progressive, or at least more progressive politics. So um, yes, so so education, it doesn't have much to do with it. Trust in government does have a lot to do with it. And the connections between ideological commitments and attitudes about vaccines are very, very strong. There's a lot of literature showing that correspondence, Hallie. So I think the kind of scientific claims people make about 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 um, vaccines are not safe, and I read this study, and the, it, it's more of a post hoc post hoc rationalization of um, an ideological commitment that's already been put in place. It's, it seems that there's some it, it, related to those ideological commitments, their values clarification, their prioritizations of values. There's also the, the concern about risk aversion. And you know, it's personal profiles of risk aversion as well. And I'm just curious if you, if you were to, well, at some point maybe some of this additional survey research may come out to to say, okay, uh, it's some's more important, some's less important. You're you're pointing out what some has already said. Thank you very much. This has been a, a great a great talk, Maya. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ali. Next question, Martin. Thanks. Uh, hi, Maya. Um, so I'm just wondering um, if you could very briefly say to what extent these results are generalizable. Uh, I mean, like discussing politics. And so you mentioned liberal democracies, but are those studies uh, predominantly conducted in like uh, US and Canada or maybe the UK and Australia or, or uh, are there also studies coming from like Europe? And so, in that in that um, in that sense, I'm just wondering to what extent they are not context sensitive to the particular uh, details of the political situation in, like, North America, for instance, as opposed to elsewhere. Um, the the research that I'm drawing from um, covers uh, Europe, uh, Australia and uh, US and Canada. Of course, the most that you'll find is, is coming out of uh, the US. Uh, there's a lot from Britain. There's actually quite a lot out of Australia just because there's a good sort of cluster of, of uh, um, uh, vaccine hesitancy researchers, like social scientists at the, at the University of Sydney. But um, it is not just to English speaking languages. There's um, a lot of consistency with what we're seeing in, in, in Germany, France, Italy. Um, um, it, 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 all, it speaks to the sort of general uh, access to vaccine. So, so the sort of political situations needs to be similar, um, at least insofar as these factors. There needs to be high access to it. There needs to be relative government stability to, to make these kind of claims. As, as soon as you've got very unstable government, the, the uh, vaccine attitudes start to shift. So we've seen that in Europe around, you know, the, some of the populist governments that have come in and brought anti-vaccine views as part of their ideology. And you see how the, how the, political climate shifts around that. So we watched Italy for quite a long time around that, though eventually even the Italian uh, politicians had to come around and say, maybe we need to maybe we need to get a few more vaccines in when their when their uh, caseloads start to explode. This was I'm talking about situations like measles outbreaks in Europe prior to COVID, and we're seeing it similar here. Um, it is in COVID, however, there is um, more, um, what's, what's, I don't know what the word to use here is, um, there is more digging in on the ideological commitments. So where we saw around measles outbreaks in Europe in the years leading up to COVID, that large outbreaks would usually shift public opinion to say, maybe we need to be more tolerant of vaccines and more accepting of them. We're finding pockets of, of COVID resistance where it doesn't matter how many cases you have. Um, uh, you know, part, you know, certain US states where the more, the more cases they have, the more overflowing their IC are, they actually may have less COVID restrictions happening. So that speaks to the sort of uh, extreme politics of our time. Um, I'm, I'm going further than you asked me, Martin, but um, yes, the generalizations are at least warranted for, for uh, Western Europe, for sure. Thanks. Yeah. Christophe? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful talk. It was really uh, 
fantastic and uh, enlightening. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist, and I, I, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of your talk. So you you might you might have uh, already alluded to that. But I was wondering about the gender differences. Uh, we're doing surveys in the general population, and more precisely in students. And we have this huge survey showing that uh, women are more hesitant uh, than, than men. And I've learned that it was quite a universal finding. So I was wondering whether you, you had an explanation for that. Uh, do, do you know these kind of results and do you have any, any explanation for that? Yes, I do know about women being more hesitant than, um, than, than men, but I didn't know it would apply to university students. So these are undergraduates. Um, I knew that it applied to um, older adults, especially because, and, and, and the explanation for it was that many of the women being surveyed are the mothers, uh, are mothers, and they are the ones who will have to take care of people if they are harmed by vaccines. And because of that, they will have further reason for hesitation. So we saw um, around COVID, I was, I was very interested in surveys around vaccine hesitancy among healthcare workers. It was kind of an interesting thing to look at because everyone expected the healthcare workers to be in favor of vaccines. And among those healthcare workers, there were definitely more women than men that were hesitant. And that seemed to do around the sort of gender roles that, that people have. So these were women that were, especially early on, they were offered the vaccines. First, they worried about fertility, pregnancy, because if they have pregnancy or fertility problems, the, the burden will be placed on them more than their um, male partners will be. If anyone is harmed by it, they're the ones that are going to have to juggle the work and the, and the domestic care. So that seemed to explain why women had more reason to want more information and therefore be hesitant. As for university age women, I don't know. I, I'm assuming they're not mothers and don't have those kinds of caregiving roles. So um, I can't explain that. The mother thesis, though, um, uh, seems seems compelling and is um, is is worthy of more attention. There is definitely more COVID resistance across the board of women that are of uh, childbearing age and interested in doing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Interesting. So this uh, we end on this uh, mystery question. We don't have an explanation for this uh, fact. Uh, I wonder though whether I mean to what extent it's really an explanation in the sense that uh, you could interpret, um, I mean, in, when you don't have enough information on vaccines, you could interpret either uh, vaccination or non-vaccination as being uh, a possible cause for you to have the burden of care of uh, someone who will suffer from yes. either the disease or the vaccination. So is it really an explanation in that, in that extent? Uh, well, um... Another minor explanation, sorry about that, is that usually women take the responsibility for vaccinating their children you know, much more than men. <laughs> so it might be also that they, they are more fearing the, the, the potential consequences uh, uh, than would uh, men. And it may apply for, for students too. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that is known. Um, I, I noticed this sort of a, when I was studying, this is just an anecdote, when I studied, uh, when I was looking closely at childhood vaccination, that you sometimes hear cases of uh, of uh, divorcing couples going to court to argue about whether to vaccinate their child or not. One parent wants it, one parent doesn't. Uh, it, as far as I know, courts always rule in favor of vaccination because of best interests of the child. But I used to follow these stories, they would come up in my newsfeed, and eventually I stopped checking is it the mother or is it the father who is uh, who is uh, saying their child should not be vaccinated? Because a hundred percent of the time, there's always the mother refusing and the and the father saying we we should vaccinate. And I think that does speak to the uh, to the to the role of mothering versus the role of, of father. The mother needs to decide, and when she's not supported on that, she's the one that's going to 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 dig in the fields, to dig in her heels about that. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Maya, do you want to add? Uh, so, sorry, you were about maybe to add some. I will, part of no, I'll, I'll stop there. I was going to say one more one, one more thing about the uh, whether the whether you had asked uh, Maya whether it was a um, um, whether that was an explanation or not. Would you say, would you say that again? Oh, what, yeah, what? Oh, yeah, I was saying so. Is it an explanation if I mean you could take uh, the, the opposite view that actually, if they trusted the vaccine, for instance, they would, they would also blame on themselves the fact that uh, the, the, the kids would suffer from, I mean, or would be in charge at least of the consequences of the disease itself. That, that's yes. And okay, that now I now I remember what I want to say. Yes, that's true. But we, we might getting in be getting into 
uh, the, the fallacy of, of thinking about omission versus commission. A lot of people believe that they can protect their children from COVID and from measles and things like that. Uh, the, the diff and because you can do things to try to try to keep them home from school, homeschool them, that kind of thing. While the harms that come from vaccines, you are powerless against. And because that alone in, instills a lot of fear in people. Uh, even the healthcare workers said, look, I've, some of them say they know the risk that they uh, that they experience every day when they go to work unvaccinated, that they say, look, I've gotten this far by washing my hands, wearing a mask, you know, doing all these things that I can do. If it, once you put the vaccine in me, I can't do anything about it. Okay, thank you. Yes, I take it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you very much, Maya. Thanks again. Um, so our next speaker for the audience, Toma, maybe you remember, I have, uh, uh, it's, yeah, it slipped out from my memory, but at least you can see that on the website. Uh, as I... It's Maria, Maria Kronfelder. Ah, right. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and it's next month, right? No. I think so. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's check that on the, on the, on the, on the website. Um, additional comment, uh, as we said in the beginning, the talk was recorded. So if anyone wants to see it again, uh, it will be available in a couple of days, I guess, or maybe a week from, uh, from now uh, on our website as well. So thank you very much again, Maya, for, for the talk. And, uh, and thank you for everyone, to everyone for attending the talk.